With more than 6,000 small and micro-cap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple, at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to the C-Suite series presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC-registered FINRA-licensed broker-dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. Today's interview features PDS Biotechnology, NASDAQ ticker symbol PDSB. Noble Senior Research Analyst Robert LaBoyer interviews PDS Biotechnology CEO Frank Bedu Adeo, CMO Lauren Wood, and CFO Seth Van Voorhees. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description for Noble's research on PDS Biotech as well as news and advanced market data. And now, here's Robert, Frank, Lauren, and Seth. Hello, I'm Robert LaBoyer, Senior Biotechnology Analyst at Noble Capital. With me here today is PDS Biotech, the CEO, Frank Bedu Otto, Dr. Lauren Wood, and Dr. Seth Van Voorhees. We'll begin our discussion with an introduction from Dr. Bedu Otto about PDS, its origins, and the products that it's developing. Dr. Bedu Otto, can you tell us a little bit about the company's technology and proprietary products? Hey, well, Robert, thank you very much for having us on today. So PDS Biotechnology is a New Jersey-based mid-clinical stage cancer immunotherapy company. And the company's products are based on our proprietary Versimmune technology platform that has, been demonstra has demonstrated strong potential to overcome some of the more significant limitations facing cancer immunotherapy today. Now, the Versimmune technology and products are 100% owned by PDS Biotechnology. Importantly, the company is led by a very experienced and accomplished management team. PDS Biotech has been publicly traded on the NASDAQ as PDSB since March of 2019, so approximately two years. And PDS Biotech went public through a reverse merger with Edge Therapeutics. The company has a robust patent portfolio and the technology is currently patented through the mid 2030s. Now, PDS Biotech has three phase two human clinical trials of our lead product, PDS0101, in progress. And each of these trials is partnered with a leading institution in the field. So the National Cancer Institute, MD Anderson Cancer Center, as well as Merck. And we see these partnerships as a strong validation, not only of our science, but also the selected target indications. And as you mentioned, the National Cancer Institute was involved in the development of Versimmune. Can you tell us a little bit about the product, how it works, and the stages of development that it's in? All right, so, so um, the National Cancer Institute has worked very closely with PDS. The National Cancer Institute, per se, was not in, involved in the development of the technology, but they've worked with us on development of PDS0101 specifically. And Ver Versimmune is a T-cell activating platform that has been engineered and demonstrated to overcome some of the key limitations of immunotherapy which is really the ability to promote the induction of powerful tumor attacking killer T cells within the body, right? So most tumors express or contain unique proteins that are not expressed by our normal healthy cells. And these atypical proteins called antigens can be recognized by our T cells. So the tumor associated protein specific to the cancer we're seeking to treat is combined and administered with Versimune. Versimune then activates the critical immunological processes and signaling pathways that enable the recruitment and training of large numbers of killer T cells to specifically recognize the cancer. And it also enhances the killing potency of the prime T killer T cells, therefore enabling them to efficiently target and kill the tumor cells. So we have a simplified description of the mechanism by which Versimune works. In, on, in a white paper that's available on, on our website, but also the scientific details of the novel mechanism of action were published 
in June of 2019 in a top peer reviewed journal, which is the Journal of Immunology. Right, so as a result of the demonstrated promise of this platform, PDS Biotechnology is developing a robust and deep versimmune-based immuno-oncology pipeline that addresses over 10 different types of cancer. Right now, in addition to cancer, um, or rather with, with respect to these T cells specifically, right? We, as we know, several technologies have been reported to induce T cells, and a few of these have shown clinical promise, but ultimately have resulted in suboptimal clinical efficacy. So we know today that not all T cells are created equal. So merely inducing an antigen specific T cell response is not nearly enough to generate an adequate anti-tumor immune response. So very importantly, to induce a clinically effective anti-tumor immune response, we must induce the right type of killer T cell. It must be generated in the right quantity and also with the right killing potency, right? It's only when we achieve all three that we will induce a, we will induce a clinically effective immunotherapy, right? So PDS's Verse Immune Technology Platform has now been demonstrated in both preclinical and early human clinical trials to uniquely achieve all three, right phenotype of killer T cell, high quantity, as well as strong killing potency. Uh, what about the specific tumor types that you're testing? And you discussed a little bit about the stage of development and the types of tumors. Right, I'll, I'll actually hand over to um, Dr. Lauren Wood to walk us through the human clinical trials and briefly, our lead program is a PDS0101 trial that addresses HPV cancers, and Dr. Wood will talk, talk a little bit more about those trials. But in our pipeline, we have a, quite a robust pipeline. PDS0102 um, addresses prostate, breast, and, um, and some leukemias. PDS0103 addresses Mach one related cancers, which include breast, colorectal, ovarian, and non-small cell lung cancer. And PDS0104 addresses melanoma. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Wood to walk us through exactly what we're doing with those products. Great. Thank you, Frank and Robert. Um, as Frank mentioned, PDS0101 is our lead candidate product, and it targets HPV-associated cancers, specifically HPV-16-associated cancers. HPV-16 is known to be the most oncogenic and the most refractory high-risk HPV. Um, as Frank mentioned, we have three trials. Um, all in phase two, in collaboration with leading institutional partners. Um, the first trial I'll talk about is our phase two trial being done in collaboration with the National Cancer Institute. Our overarching strategy of all of our partnerships is to combine PDS-0101 with state-of-the-art treatments like checkpoint inhibitors, other clinical stage immunotherapies, as well as the standard of care to maximize our potential to deliver improved outcomes in the broadest population of HPV-associated cancer patients. The furthest progressed of these trials is the NCI trial, which is looking at PDS-0101 in combination with two agents. Um, one is Binstrup Alpha, also known as M7824. It's a second generation biofunctional checkpoint inhibitor that targets both TGF beta as well as PDL1. And a second tumor targeting cytokine called NHS IL 12. Um, the three agents are delivered in combination, and they're being studied in patients with HPV-associated cancers. Now, these cancers include um, anal cell carcinoma, head and neck cancer, cervical cancer, vulval vaginal cancer, penile cancer. So it's a broad range of HPV-associated cancers that's being targeted by this trial. Importantly, we're studying the combination in two groups of patients. One is patients who are naive to checkpoint inhibitors. We're clearly aware that immunotherapy has become one of the corner mainstays now of cancer treatment. And then the second population that's also included in the trial is those who are checkpoint refractory or experienced to receipt of checkpoint inhibitors and have had some kind of disease progression. 
importantly, these individuals have advanced recurrent metastatic disease. So um, they have received a minimum of one and typically more um, than two to three rounds of treatment before they're receiving this triple combination. Uh, I'd like to also highlight importantly that uh, the approach of using this triple combination was based on some very rigorous preclinical science that was performed by our collaborators at the NCI. It was published last year in um, June of 2020 in the Journal of Immunotherapy for Cancer. And in preclinical tumor models that examine regression of HPV-related tumors, um, the agents were examined alone, as well as in dual combination, as well as in the triple combination. And it was observed that with the triple combination, we actually saw the greatest tumor regression, as well as, um, importantly, definitive confirmation that this triple combination led to HPV-specific T cells migrating to the tumor. Um, and attacking the tumor, which is critically important. As Frank highlighted, it's about the right quality of T cell, it's about the right quantity of T cell, about the right potency of T cell, and definitively making sure that the T cell tracks through the tumor and gets the job done. Um, uh, we uh, had a press release earlier this year um, confirming the fact that um, the trial had met its preliminary objective, um, observing at least three or more responses in the first eight patients that would then lead to um, enrollment of the full trial as, as projected. Um, we also know that um, uh, uh, this trial, data on this trial will be presented at um, next month's ASCO meeting. Um, an oral abstract presentation about the trial will be presented by the trial's PI, Dr. Julia Strauss, um, with updated information on the outcomes. Versatile 002 is a multi-center trial that we're doing in collaboration with our partner Merck, um, looking at PDS 0101 in combination with pembrolizumab, also known as Keytruda, for the treatment of individuals who are naive to checkpoint inhibitors, and so they're receiving, eligible to receive first-line treatment for their recurrent metastatic disease. The main objectives of this trial are to see what the objective response rate is um, in these patients receiving the dual combination. We know historically with Keynote 048 that um, the response rates are only about 20% to Keytruda monotherapy, one to five. And our goal in treating this patient population is to actually see if we can move the needle so that we see objective responses in at least 32 to 33% of the patients, which is one in three. So our goal is having, um, instead of just one in five patients able to respond to an immunotherapy, to seeing one in three patients or more responding to the combination. Um, our third study that we're doing is in collaboration with investigators at MD Anderson Cancer Institute. Again, another uh, world-renowned cancer institution. Um, this study is also based on very strong and uh, rigorous preclinical science and clinical science by our collaborators. And this trial is combining PDS-0101 in combination with standard of care chemo radiation therapy in women with locally advanced, large, bulky cervical cancer tumors. So this is going to be the first treatment regimen um, for these patients. It's based on some very strong preclinical science which suggests that women who are undergoing standard of care treatment for their cervical cancer, if they develop HPV specific responses early on in treatment, those individuals tend to do better in terms of disease-free and progression-free outcomes compared to those who don't develop their responses. So PDS-0101 is being delivered with standard of care chemo radiation, which includes cisplatinum, four to six doses, as well as radiation. Importantly, we're delivering one dose of PDS-0101 before the standard regimen starts, and then we continue to deliver additional doses of PDS-0101 during the course of that chemo radiation treatment.
So those are our current phase two trials. Um, we will have, in addition to the updated clinical outcomes you're going to hear at ASCO in early June, we anticipate that we will have data on the first 12 patients enrolled in the study in Q4 of this year, um, as well as potentially additional data in Q1 of 2022, and a readout from the Andy Anderson trial, again, late Q4 and in the first quarter of 2022 regarding clinical readouts and updates. Just uh, several points about uh, what you just mentioned. And mm -hmm. the combination with the checkpoint inhibitors was an interesting point about the clinical trials. And the response rate that you mentioned of 20% is pretty much in line with many different tumor types where checkpoint inhibitors can be very effective, but the response rate is low. and if, if I'm understanding the mechanism of action, it would seem that the checkpoint inhibitors are preventing the tumors from hiding from the immune system. Their mechanism is to block the tumor from turning off the immune system and allowing it to be recognized Correct. by the cells that will kill it. But the problem in many cases is that the tumors don't have adequate numbers of immune cells present, what's sometimes described as an immune desert, so that you can uncover them and open them for attack, but they, the immune system doesn't have the cells to actually carry out the attack and kill them. So it sounds as if the combination allows the immune system to recognize them and then verse immune attracts the right cells and carries out the killing. Would that be correct? That is correct. You summarized it beautifully as if you were an immunology professor <laughs> trying to explain uh, an introductory lesson about what the role is of PDSO 101. And that is it exactly. We, we know um, the, the imagination has been captured um, regarding the power of immunotherapy. And like you said, what we need to do is we need to increase the number of individuals who are able to objectively respond. And the primary reason for their lack of response is they are lacking those T cells that are able to specifically track an attack to the tumor. And that is exactly what we aim to do with PDSO 101, is to arm the immune system, ramp up that army of T cells, so that when the checkpoint inhibitor decamouflages the tumor, you've got an army primed and ready to go and can go right in and attack those, tumor, uh, attack those tumors. But it's importantly, not an army that's shooting blanks. It's an army of T cells that's potent, that are really firing the bullets to get the job done and kill the tumor. Yes, you, you mentioned the, the different populations of immune cells and the idea that you are stimulating the right cells to get the job done. Correct. So That's it, nicely right. it would work well with the immune, the checkpoint inhibitors that uncover the tumor, and then first immune can come in and kill it. Precisely. And some of, the, some of the tumor types that you mentioned have very low response rates. The 20%, uh, an improvement to 30 would be a significant clinical impact. And the fact that you're going after both naive patients and patients who failed and are in recurrence would address the not only the early stage patients, but also the later stage patients. Would that support, are these uh, endpoints that would be taken in combination or in sequence to get approval or what, what would be the, the strategy there? So the strategy regarding regulatory approval is always first and foremost going to be delivered, uh, driven by the data. But the points that you mentioned are very, very important. Um, 
we, we are focusing on combinations because we are focusing on the recurrent metastatic disease population. And we know that patients who have recurrent metastatic tumors, combination therapy is necessary. A single agent, even the most potent of potent agents, is not going to get the job done when you're talking about the recurrent metastatic setting where there's a, advanced disease. Um, the specific reason for targeting the checkpoint naive population is to maximize the opportunities for these checkpoint inhibitors to work the first go round. Mm -hmm. Again, allowing that combination where the checkpoint's gonna unmask the tumor, but in the first round of treatment, we've armed the immune system by delivering PDSO 101 and stimulating these killer T cells that are then gonna attack the tumor. The rationale for looking at the checkpoint refractory population is that this is an area of huge unmet medical need where individuals had exposure to checkpoint inhibitors. They might have had some kind of response that may have been sustained. Um, they may have had to come off therapy for immune related adverse events. Um, but there's a huge need now of individuals who are checkpoint what we call refractory or resistant. They've had some kind of exposure and um, we need a new approach to see if we can flip the switch and this second go round uh, make that opportunity and the activity of that regimen more optimal. And that's the reason for including the checkpoint refractory population. And that actually is the population where there is the greatest unmet medical need right now. Yes, right. uh, I would agree. You, you're looking at a patient population that will relapse and they'll have a longer time to relapse, but in the end, they still relapse. Right. And the Correct. point of these trials is survival and improving mm -hmm. survival. Uh, and that's and one of the things that, Robert, is, is very unique about immunotherapies, and that is what we call the long tail. Um, again, uh, only a minority. Of patients right now respond to checkpoint inhibitors first round 20 percent 25 percent maybe with the second generation checkpoint inhibitors m7824 um in hpv related cancers they had an initial response rate of 30 percent but most are 20 percent but the 20 percent that respond Boy, oh boy, those responses are impressive. And you see that very long tail that prolongs survival. You get a duration of response that's incredible. So what we want to do is kind of raise the tide and increase with the combination the number of individuals who are ex uh, experiencing that objective response rate and then also experience that prolonged tail and duration of response that leads to prolonged overall survival. One other point about the refractory patients is that since these patients have failed prior courses of chemotherapy and checkpoint inhibitors, if they're being retreated with Versamune and there's a benefit, you've eliminated all other variables and any signal of activity would be attributed to the combination in addition to Versamune. Would that be correct? Well, uh we, we, we would like to think that, but the issue is, is as, a, as a clinical scientist, um, being a purist, you always want to make sure that you don't have assumptions. So the assumption is, is that yes, the addition of Versamune to the regimen um, is responsible for the improved outcomes, but we always want to have um, be, be undergirded by science that absolutely confirms that. And that would be driven by ultimately what is seen with the clinical data and then what the regulatory authorities would, would require. Um, one of the things that I do want to highlight about um, our collaborators and our Versa Immune Platform technology and our general approach in, in PDS Bio is we really make an effort to do some very significant and rigorous preclinical testing and optimization um, of our therapies before we go into human clinical trials and do um, examine our platform products in patients. So uh, we like to see recapitulation. We like to see reproducibility of what we observe in preclinical animal model studies because it helps us better understand what potentially may be going on 
um, in our human clinical trials, especially with the early signals, like in these phase two trials. One of the other things about the mechanism of action is that you, can, you have potential to not only have an immediate therapeutic benefit on people who have disease, but it, would there also be potential for immune surveillance to prevent metastasis? Absolutely. Um, I come at this approach and these therapies as an immunologist. The immunology universe is vast, diverse, um, it's infinite. Um, but as an immunologist, I'd like to say all the time, uh, a potent, um, highly specific, highly quantitative immune response is uh, the kind of gift that keeps on giving. Because once your immune system has been primed to recognize what the cancer enemy looks like, you then have. Um, just like uh, going back to our military analogy and the T-cell army, it's like having sentinel guards, sentry guards, you know, that are all over, stationed all over, and they're there, sentry. They're looking for the enemy. And if the enemy shows up, then they recognize it, take it out, and get rid of it so that it can't establish a stronghold. Um, and that is um, the power of immune responses um, and immunotherapy to really alter the immune system and be able to train the immune system to really recognize, as Frank mentioned early on, those unique specific uh, tumor proteins that are specific to the tumor and are not really um, expressed on other normal tissues. You also have a program with, with SARS-CoV-2, a virus that causes COVID-19. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'll, I'll go into the preliminary details about what we're hoping to accomplish in terms of uh, the clinical trial and the study, and then I'll let Frank and Seth also weigh in um, regarding our partnership um, with our Brazilian partners, PharmaCorps. Um, we are working with the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation uh, in Brazil, and they've committed to funding a clinical trial program. Uh, we hope to initiate uh, a phase one, two study by uh, Q3 of this year to establish both safety and immunogenicity of PDS0101. This is Versimmune plus a piece of the spike protein, which we know is critical to induce not only antibody responses, but also contains um, regions that are conserved, which T cells recognize. And that's part of the reason we want to leverage using Versimmune with these antigens in uh, to address SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Um, assuming that we have any positive results from that trial, we're prepared to quickly move into a phase three trial to confirm um, the activity of PDS uh, uh, 0203 in COVID-19. Um, Frank, I would uh, I'll allow you to maybe expand a little bit more on the full partnership of our consortium with our Brazilian partners, because it is a U.S. as well as Brazilian partnership. And maybe you can elaborate on that uh, further with PharmaCorps, um, as well as um, our other partners involved. So Robert, I think one of the key things here is in terms of the combination of Versimmune and the SARS-CoV-2 protein, what's really unique about this, right? And what we know about Versimmune is not, it's very effective in presenting and generating the T cells. And one of the key things we know with that spike protein is there are a number of conserved regions in that, within that protein. And we know today that this virus has significant propensity for mutation. But what we also know is that there are a number of regions in that protein or the spike region that remain conserved and don't change as the protein or as the virus mutates. And so the way we see this is if we are able to replicate what we have shown in preclinical studies where we can generate CD8 and CD4 T cells specifically targeting those conserved regions and epitopes in that spike protein, that will be the first step in generating a, pro, a, a vaccine that generates a broad range of immune responses that could potentially continue to be protective as the virus continues to mutate. 
right? And we think that's going to be very important in the second generation of COVID-19 vaccines. And so with the reverse immune technology, being able to generate those tumor, those um, T cells, virus attacking T cells that attack and focus on the conserved regions of the virus is important. But reverse immune is also, as we've reported and has been published, induces very potent neutralizing antibody responses against the spike protein. So having both the neutralization as well as the T cell response leads to a much broader and what we what we think will be a, provide stronger immunity against the virus. Now, also Lauren mentioned the memory T cell responses. Those become just imp as important in a viral infection as it is in cancer. Because if you can generate those long-term memory T cell responses that recognize those conserved regions of the virus, then when that virus shows up again in some different form, but still has those conserved regions present, the immune system still recognizes it as a foreign agent that shouldn't be there and attacks and eliminates those infected cells. So that's really the, the broader idea behind the verse immune, the verse immune based COVID-19 vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, we are actually, we, as Lauren mentioned, we have funding from the um, Brazilian Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation to commercialize this vaccine in Brazil specifically. And so our partners, Pharmacor, who are based in Brazil, are responsible for executing the development program in Brazil, right? So for getting the product developed and also executing the clinical trials in Brazil. And so even though it's a consortium of partners, we are really providing the Versimune and the expertise regarding Versimune, but our partners are actually responsible for interactions with Anvisa, which is their regulatory agency, performing the trials and developing the product in Brazil. That's a very good program. And as, as you mentioned, uh, the idea that you're going after the conserved proteins rather than the ones that vary and give rise to mutations is an important point because the current vaccines were approved under emergency use authorization, not long-term clinical trials. So we really don't know the durability or the long-term efficacy against this virus or variants. Even though the right. pandemic restrictions may be ending shortly, the virus is not going away and will continue to mutate so that uh, this, the immediate problem may have passed, but this virus has not gone away, and this That's will remain right. a problem in the future. Uh, that is correct. Yeah. The CEO of Pfizer had mentioned the possibility of a third vacci vaccination and a booster mm -hmm. of the immunity. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is this is not a problem that's been solved by the current vaccines. That's correct. That's correct. Absolutely correct. And I think as we, as, as you noted, Robert, because of the emergence of the variants, the entire field, um, uh, a full 14, 15 months now into this pandemic, um, the focus in infectious disease and specifically as it relates to SARS-CoV-2 is how can we induce T cell responses right. mm -hmm. for conserved reasons of this virus? Um, that's not typically been an, a focus for infectious disease vaccines. It's really always been, you know, neutralizing antibodies, generating them rapidly, quickly, having a high level of neutralization, making sure um, those antibody responses are sustained. But um, clearly, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 is is driving the need and the interest to focus on um, T cell induction directed towards the virus to be able to, to mitigate having to chase after variant after variant after variant after variant, because we, we know that's going to continue. Can you discuss some of the milestones ahead over the next few months and the next year? As Frank and Lauren has have been describing, we have three clinical trials ongoing. Um, we've announced interim results uh, on the NCI trial, and that uh, and uh, more extensive data will be released um, in, in uh, on June 7th at the ASCO meeting, in which we will be making an, an or, or I should say an oral presentation will be made uh, that is focused on our technology. 
Um, in addition, we have two other trials that are ongoing and recruiting patients, and we expect to result uh, to report interim results uh, in the late fourth quarter into the early next year. Um, and that so as a result, we have a number of near-term milestones that we expect from all three of our our, our clinical trials. Um, in terms of uh, one of the nice things about our 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 activities. Um, is that we are relative, our cash burn is relatively modest for a company of our size and act activities. Um, our, we currently have about $29 million of cash outstanding from our uh, reported in our last uh, 10K. Um, and we burn approximately a million and a half dollars per month. So uh, about $18 million a year. So our cash resources are, are sufficient to, to take us through the first half of next year. And in that period, we will have had interim readouts from all three of our phase two trials. Um, and that um, one of the reasons that we're able to operate in such an efficient manner is that two of the three clinical trials that we have ongoing are investigator sponsored studies, which involve relatively modest levels of financial commitment from, from PDS, but we still get the full benefit in fact, uh, of, of those studies. Uh, and the, the third study being the one with, with Merck's Cotruder is the one that is being fully financed uh, by PDS. However, it is in partnership, uh, in close collaboration with Merck in terms of its on, ongoing activities. Yes. Right, and Robert, just add a little bit to that, to what uh, Seth just said. So with, with the three trials, right, with the first milestone coming up is the oral presentation by the NCI at ASCO regarding the triple combination. And as, as you know, having an oral presentation for interim data at ASCO is not at all common, right? So we are quite enthusiastic about that. And also the next two trials, we didn't talk much about that, but those two trials um, in terms of combinations with standard of care, Right, and specifically, we picked standard of care for a key reason. Those are agents that have been shown to be effective in the specific indications that they have been approved for by the FDA. So we're going in combination with agents that have already been shown to be effective in the specific target indications. With this approach, we're significantly mitigating risk, and also if we are able to show that the combination is superior to the standard of care, without compounding toxicity, we believe we have a rapid and clear path to commercialization of the combination. And so two out of the three trials for which we will have the milestones coming up in the next nine to 12 months are with standard of care. And the, the most advanced one is the one with two other investigational agents. And so we're covering a broad range of cancers, but also giving ourselves that opportunity for rapid commercialization if we demonstrate that this is superior to, to the standard of care in two of those three trials. It sounds as if adding Versimmune or adding the product to the standard of care, to, to the current standard of care, right. would be consistent with the current practice of medicine and easy to add rather than completely changing the practice of oncology. This, exactly. This the current practice of medicine. So, it's not a, a complete um, retraining or new way of thinking about it. They're adding something to what they're already doing. Exactly. And one of the key reasons we're able to do this is the unique combination of safety and potency. Because to be able to do this, the safety component is necessary, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to compound the toxicity. And so that puts Versimmune in a pretty unique position where we, we've demonstrated the potential for that strong anti-tumor response, but also very well tolerated, not generating the kinds of toxicities typical of oncology. I would only add to that is the, the, the it's an exciting time to be part of at PDS for, for a number of reasons. But one of the things that's important to understand is our Versimmune technology is incredibly flexible. All of the clinical trials that we've talked about here are a combination with a single antigen, HPV-16, with our Versimmune technology. But we've identified 74 antigens that are compatible for oncology efforts. And in fact, we have three under development in a, in a preclinical fashion. 
So as a consequence, if we are able to demonstrate the data that we expect to be reporting from the three phase two clinical trials that are currently ongoing, it should open up a wealth of opportunities well beyond that product for the combination of Versimmune with other antigens. And that can be opportunities that we at PDS pursue, but it also would open up what we believe will be a number of opportunities for out-licensing uh, discussions. 74 antigens is quite a library. This is a, product. Right. This is a product with an entire pipeline behind it. And exactly. this is almost like, like a product with interchangeable antigens that can be suited to many different tumor types, whether That's you pursue correct. them in-house or out-license them to others. This is, um, this is quite a pipeline and the potential to use this product to address all of those different tumor antigens is uh, it's quite remarkable. So the, the next question that comes to mind is, do you have the resources to address all of these things? 29 million and, and a low burn rate will, will take you to early 22 or so. But based on these opportunities, you could probably fund a, a large number more if you had the resources. You mentioned possible out licensing, but uh, it sounds as if you have milestones that would influence the valuation and you would have the opportunity to raise additional cash when you choose. Is that part of your, your strategy? Certainly. You know, our cash resources, as I mentioned, will take us through the first half of next year for the three clinical trials that we have underway. It, however, it would be our expectation that at some point this year, we will, we will uh, uh, enhance our capital resources through an equity raise um, so that we, we are able to continue to pursue those clinical trials, but also expand the opportunities and the developments that we see with some of the work that's being done on a quick preclinical basis. Right. Great. And Robert, one, the key thing here also is that with clinical trials, if current ongoing phase two trials are real proof of concept trials for the technology platform, right? So once we successfully demonstrate that this technology works, it then opens up a significant um, range of opportunities. We will never internally have the resources necessary to develop all these products, right? So then the next yes. part of the strategy will then be, once we've demonstrated proof of concept, will then be to strategically partner or out license for specific indications, where we then start to generate non-dilutive revenue to fund some of these other programs that we would want to develop internally. But the, the ongoing phase two trials are very important as since they are going to be the first proof of concept trials, specifically demonstrating the potential and ability of this technology to do what we have been talking about today. That sounds as if you're going to balance the financial resources with the opportunities and fund them based on the company's ability to carry out the clinical trials compared with the opportunity to outlicense to others. Correct. So that, uh, that sounds like a very reasonable strategy and balance between opportunities and cost of development. Okay, uh, are there any other comments or, or programs that we haven't discussed that you'd like to point out? Not really. I, th I think uh, one key thing to mention is that our pipeline is actually currently being progressed, right, in preclinical development. So the follow-on programs to PDS 0101, which are 0102, based upon the TARP program that address prostate, breast cancer, and AML, as well as PDS0103, that's actually currently being partnered with the NCI and studies are going to be initiated at the NCI soon, are very close to clinical development. So we expect to get at least one or two of those into human clinical trials sometime next year, early next year. So those, the pipeline development is also progressing in parallel with the ongoing phase two clinical trials. Thank you for joining us for this C-suite interview presentation brought to you by Channel Check. Visit our YouTube channel for more interview content, as well as virtual roadshows and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and microcap companies listed.